the new Ant Biology webinar series presented to you by the Translational Outcomes Research Group of the Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta. This new series aims to celebrate the latest advances in the field of life science along with its relatedness to other disciplines. We shall be having two lectures every two weeks with Saturday lectures on topics related to other disciplines and Sunday lectures on different topics of the life sciences. I am Shinjini and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I would like to inform you that you can post your questions in the YouTube chat box and we shall moderate them at the end of the lecture. You are free to interact with each other and with the speaker. And if you have any questions or comments meant for the speaker or for us, feel free to email us and we shall address it to the best of our abilities. And you can also send us your feedback through the feedback link which will be, which will be provided in the chat box near the end of the session. So without any further delay, I would request our convener, uh, Professor Rena Ray Banerjee of the Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta, to introduce our new webinar series and to welcome our speaker, Professor Rajshekhar Basu of the University of Calcutta. Ma'am. Thank you, Shinjini. A very uh, good evening um, uh, from Kolkata, India, to uh, all our um, viewers uh who are uh, with us live now and to all the future viewers who will be uh, doubtless tuning in to the uh, archive talks um in our youtube channel um we had organized an earlier series prospects uh, progress and prospects in biology um which has ended on the 31st of january this year and we are happy to announce that we are um, uh, starting another uh, new series with a slightly different philosophy uh, in the sense that we shall be celebrating biology not only from uh, a, uh, you know, biologists, uh, uh, somebody trained in life sciences, only the branches of life sciences uh, sort of a perspective, but we shall uh, uh, take a slightly different point of view in the sense uh, what Shinjini uh, has already introduced, that we shall have uh, fortnightly uh, lectures, Saturdays uh, by somebody from another discipline, uh, not life sciences, and on Sunday from somebody who is working directly in um, uh, a stream of uh, the biological sciences. So uh, we shall be uh, bringing to you uh, what the researchers and thinkers around the world in biology are working on. However, biology is hardly an unconnected, uh, isolated subject. So the Saturday lectures, we hope, will also um, sensitize you to reflect upon uh, biology from a uh, not strictly biologist's point of view because ultimately everything is connected. So to celebrate the connectedness, um, the first uh, of and biology webinar series lecture is being given by uh, none other than Professor Raj Shekhar Boshu, who is uh, my colleague. And I welcome him heartily uh, on the webinar series. And I shall be introducing him uh, Professor Raj Shekhar Boshu is a full-time faculty in the Department of History, University of Calcutta. He had previously been a faculty at the Robindra Bharati University and Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Boshu had also served as ICCR Chair in Contemporary Indian Studies at the Maikolo Romeris University, Vilnius. He was also the recipient of several international fellowships, which include Charles Wallace Fellowship, Welcome Trust Travel Grants, Fulbright Seminar Grants, and the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute Fellowships. He has also held visiting professorships at the Heidelberg University, Tartu University, Tallinn University, Charles University, Praha, CNRS Paris, Lund University, Uppsala University, University of Marseille, and the Czech Academy of Sciences, and the University of Canterbury, Christchurch. He was also the ICCR sponsored resource person at the conference on diaspora, slavery, migration, and racism in uh, Paramaibo, Suriname in 2018. 
He has also been the co-investigator of a project sponsored by the India New Zealand Educational Council to carry out research on the health, labor, and migration in the Pacific in the 19th and 20th centuries. He has specialized in several research fields, which include Dalit history, histories, histories of migration, and the history of science and technology. He has a large number of publications in the form of monographs, edited volumes, book chapters, and articles in journals published by the leading international publishing houses like Sage, Oxford University Press, Palgrave, Macmillan, Cambridge Scholars Publishing, and Rutledge. So with that, it is our absolute honor to welcome you, Professor Basu, and we uh, uh, open the series with your talk which I'm sure promises to be an extremely interesting one. Thank you. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. First, me, uh, first let me put myself on record uh, uh, by extending my gratitude to Professor Anna Roy Banerjee, who's a very esteemed colleague of mine in the uh, Science College campus of Badiganj, and her team for inviting me uh, to this talk. Uh, this is really unique as I go by what Shenjini and Professor Ray Banerjee had to uh, offer in, uh, as introductory uh, remarks. Uh, <clears throat> it is very interesting that, uh, that this thing is coming through because uh, as I was uh, discussing with Professor Ray Banerjee before we went on air, that uh, we used to have these sort of interactions and discussions about 70, 80 years back. But suddenly, after the Indian independence and the Indian nation state taking its form, uh, somewhere down the line, despite all talks of interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity multidisciplinarity, uh, interdisciplinary linkages, we have not really in India gone that far in terms of interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity. We've just borrowed ideas here and there, uh, whether we teach science or whether we teach humanities. And we've tried to say that, well, we are being interdisciplinary. We are not being interdisciplinary by, by doing all these things as we pretend to do. Uh, rather, uh, we need to go a long way and really search what the exact meaning of multidisciplinarity or, inter, or even interdisciplinarity means. And that's where we, I think we have been, we have been lagging behind for uh, over several decades, and it's only now that 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 university uh, faculty, whether they whether they are in humanities or in commerce or in uh, sciences, we are realizing more and more that we have the exact human resources, we have the uh, people uh, in in the university system, but we have never been in touch. And perhaps uh, Professor Ray Banerjee needs to be congratulated because. She's, she's taken the lead uh, and uh, she's spoken to me a couple of times or even more um, about the possibility of having a, a person who is not really from the same discipline or from the sciences background to come and share a few ideas on a theme that has its bearings so far as scientists are concerned. Now, I begin my lecture with a bit, with a bit of trepidation because I speak primarily before biologists. Uh, but nonetheless, this is an issue, I think, which I think biologists would also contribute in a, in perhaps in a bigger way. And uh, I was just uh, talking to Professor Ray Manaji that in the West, uh, biologists have written a lot about history of science and history of medicine. So why can't we in India think along those lines? And perhaps uh, taking a cue from a uh, very fam famous and very esteemed uh, biologist Michael Borboys. I think I'm doing the reverse as a historian to get into a biologist uh, domain. So thank you once again uh, for, for inviting me. And uh, but today I would essentially talk about uh, dams and dams, weirs, water bodies, and rivers particularly. Now, rivers have have always been in our hearts. Rivers have always stirred very strong human uh, emotions. Uh, rivers have uh, actually sustained civilizations. They have made a civilization uh, 
gain in strength. At the same time, uh, civilizations have declined because the river has changed its course or there has been a lot of siltation or there has been less water which has been flowing across the river. Now, rivers, uh, as we all know, they uh, very often in course of 500 or 1000 years, they change uh, their course. Uh, the siltation process is also not very something very uniform. You cannot really predict the sort of the siltation uh, formation that will take place. Neither can you talk about the new geological forms, which are also coming through uh, as a part of the entire discussion of the river system. And the rivers have all also been the creators or the sustainers of unique landscapes. So uh, you cannot really remove the any discussion about the river from your mental landscape. Every The river is there somewhere or the other in your mental landscape. And uh, rivers are free flowing. Uh, earlier, they were thought that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a product of nature. It's a gift of nature. Why do you need to actually strangulate the river? Why do you need to really strangulate the river? Why, why can't you let it flow as the way it flows? Despite all floods, despite all inundations, despite the human misery, that has been brought to by, by, by fast flowing rivers, by rivers which carry a lot of water. The, the, the feeling in the ancient past was that the rivers should be given their own choice to flow. But it's only in the mid, it's only in the 19th century with the, with the principle of communication of water resources gaining ground that water is not something free. It has to be taxed. It has to be used within limits, otherwise, you can charge a heavier amount that rivers and that rivers can also actually water bodies and rivers can also uh, lead to revenue maximization. Now, all these ideas had a direct bearing so far as India was concerned and primarily my discussion would be on colonial South India. Now, we find that right in the 1840s, we, there was this entire discussion on whether the government could actually impose a water cess. And 100 years down the line in 1945, we find that the government of Madras, which, uh, of, uh, which was based in Fort St. George, actually uh, brings about a very crucial amendment so far as the Irrigation, Irrigation Cess Act is concerned. Now, and we find that how does the colonial state define uh, its control or, or its supervision of water bodies? It says that uh, that all the water bodies, all the, the water resources have to be uh, utilized for the improvement of human beings. Now, right from the 1840s down till present times, you've been hearing about quote unquote advancement, improvement, progress, everything everything in the positive sense we also development and so on so so forth but this entire very developmentalist perspective it came through right from the 1840s just before the revolt of 1857 because the british were out and out trying to use these idioms as signifiers which could legitimize their which could leg, legitimize their political authority over alien uh, subjects and at the same time after the revolt had really created a lot of problems for the britishers in the 1860s we find that there is more and more talk not only of legitimacy but also in terms of harnessing water and harnessing not only water but harnessing the natural resources to the level that could lead to an advancement of the Indian civilization or the South Asian civilization. And we find that there are, there are plenty of reports, plenty of correspondences between the layers of the colonial bureaucracy about irrigation, about damming of rivers, about setting up of weirs, smaller dams. And, uh, a lot of uh, historians who could also qualify as development studies specialists like Elizabeth Whitcomb and Ian Stone uh, have written extensively about 
colonial policy so far as irrigation was concerned and whether these colonial policies have been beneficial or detrimental to the Indian society. Now, we also know that in the case of Punjab, there had been talk about the canal colonies because the canal colonies, once the irrigation canals move into the dry regions of Punjab, there would be better irrigation facilities for the farmers, for the hardworking Punjabi farmers to produce more than the, what they had been producing in the yester years. But we all know what happened with the canal colonies. In principle, uh, it is one. In praxis, it is the other side that has come. So with very promising beginnings, it ended up with disappointments at the end. Now, in South India also, we have regions like Tinnaveli and Nachin Nadu, which is bordering Travancore area or modern day Trivandrum. And there also, we, we, we have tried to study the impact of colonialism on agricultural life, particularly when these new irrigation setups come into existence. Now, uh, even prior to the 1840s, if, you want, if one goes into the early part of the 19th century, when the British were actually trying to uh, uh, set their, 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 their feet on a, farm, on a farmer footing, so far as South India was concerned, they were coming up across the rural landscape, the realities of the rural landscape, as I talk about, they were noting the fact that the channels, the canals, the tanks, and the other irrigation works were really in very, very bad shape. They were not in good condition at all. And that these uh, uh, channels, canals, tanks, and other irrigation works were very important because uh, they actually uh, were the sources from which water was drawn, and they were also acting as storages of water for agriculture. And from the 1820s down till, the eight, uh, uh, till about the 1850s or 1860s, there was a great deal of talk about commissioning, so far as commissioning of new river works or river improvement works was concerned. So we find that in those days, in 1830s and 1840s, much of the river training, much of the job regarding river training, much of the job regarding river surveying, much of the job regarding this construction work on the rivers or improvement of the water bodies was actually undertaken by the government through the British, the Royal Military. So there were uh, certain battalions within the uh, Royal, within the company service who actually <coughs> had uh, specialized engineers as bosses. So these were the people who were pressed into service. And when you see these irrigation works down to 1860s, 70s, 80s, you cannot use, you cannot actually delete or omit the names of, of certain military officials who were not only military officials, but were also qualified engineers. And particularly after the 1840s and 50s with the setting up of the Thomasson College now, now, previously the Rurki Engineering College and now the IIT Rurki. So the Tumasin College, the sort of engagement of uh, military engineers with the river, with, with the river works or with the riparian system becomes much more prominent in India. So, and the first public works department in India, so far as India is concerned, was set up in Madras in 1852. And we find that by setting up this sort of uh, department, the colonial state felt that there would be very timely leads so far as agricultural productivity was concerned, so far as revenue extraction, so, so far as strengthening of revenue extraction was concerned, and so far as increasing uh, the coffers for, for the royal treasury, for the, for, the, for the company's treasury uh, was concerned. And it is from this sort of idea that we find that rivers were, were actually, there were giant or grandeur schemes uh, were drawn up so far as damming the rivers were concerned. And uh, the rivers were not really allowed to flow freely as they flowed in the past. Now, whether they did much damage by, by, by reducing the, the quantum of the water flow uh, compared to the previous years, when they really decided to curtail the quantum of the water flow, or whether they actually increase the prospects of 
further economic activity is a is a is is a matter is a, is an issue which is open to doubt, and nothing is beyond doubt because there are groups of social scientists who would say that the damming of the rivers meant the damming of the fortunes of the Indian people. But there are uh, social scientists who would argue uh, that the damming of the rivers actually led to improvement. So I am a bit skeptic uh, in taking up a very clear cut position on this particular issue. But I'm more inclined to argue that the sort of damming of the rivers did have a damning effect. And, and it has a damning effect. Now, it is very, very clear with the sort of researchers that have gone into the Tungabhadra, with the researchers that have gone into the Kaveri Metu project, with the sort of researchers that have come into a, a very close to our, um, uh, to our home terrain, uh, the Damodar Valley Corporation. And we find that, obviously, there the historian would find an ally in the biologist see how much of species we have lost the river animals the riverine the, the riverine species have been lost and the and the sort of damage that has been done to the entire ecosystem centering around the river networks so let me uh, now uh, get into this uh, point of uh, where i start off uh, South India. And South India, once again, when there was this uh, talk of actually damming of rivers, utilizing water as a sort of commodity, uh, ex uh, maximizing the revenue out of water resources, there was always this doubt. And this doubt would always be there. Big biologists uh, who are working in South India also or sometimes who are who have friends uh, among historians they still grapple with these issues. What are dry lands and what are wet lands? Uh, can the, 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 the biologist's version be a very different for the, for the wetlands and can it be very different for the dry lands? Because the wetlands, as we all know, are essentially uh, lands which get water from the rain and there is no problem in getting uh, water. And at the same time, they are also, they, they are also bordered by free-flowing rivers, which uh, rivers which are more or less, uh, you know, uh, have water uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, they, they, they just don't go dry during the summer months as, as, as in the drier regions. Whereas in the drier regions, which are just opposed to the rain-fed uh, fields, uh, water is a constraint because you don't get that much of water. And you need to get water from, from other sources barring uh, 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 which in addition to rain so there i think the weirs and the dams this entire experiment of weirs and dams started in 1850s 1860s keeping the drier regions into consideration because the colonial bureaucracy felt that if you had a good irrigation system particularly geared for meeting the demands of the dry region then obviously there is a scope for revenue maximization. They can have they can have uh, two crops a year, perhaps. You can you can go beyond monocropping. There is the sort of debate that is there. It is it is a it goes on even into the 1880s, 1890s, and in the early part of the 19th century when the Volcker Commission comes. There's a Royal Commission of Agriculture in India, and many biologists also have contributed. They have also read these reports as much as historians. There is this entire talk of you know maximization through by by having irrigation works in the drier regions so we find that uh, that once this experiment started once the sort of debate started then obviously uh, you could not extricate yourself from the later day discussions the 20th century discussions on power on irrigation on navigation and flood control dams and so on so forth so forth but one thing which also came in the 20th century or even from the from the last decades of the 19th century is that if you are erecting dams are you preventing the free passage of migratory fish uh, from the seas sometimes or from other from the from other sources and uh, are you actually preventing the fishes from having a spawning ground so uh, is it detrimental to fisheries is it bound to reduce the number of fishes? 
Is it bound to have a very adverse effect on the fish market? Or is, and at the same time, is it going to have a very, very adverse effect on the fortunes of the riverine communities who thrive uh, through fishing? Now, these are issues which also came up uh, in 1860s in the Midwest, uh, uh, America, when these uh, sort of suddenly these dams appeared and many of the uh, the the farming many of the farming communities they complained that they couldn't get the salmon anymore the salmon doesn't reach uh, much deeper as it used to uh, do previously and that there was less and less yield of salmon every year at the same time the damming of rivers was having a very very uh, detrimental effect on the conservation of wildlife this is there biologists have written a lot uh, so far as 19th century uh, Midwest US is concerned. But we don't have those sort of writings here in India. Sadly, historians and bi biologists have not been doing this sort of work. And as a result, what we are trying to, what we are now trying to sensitize ourselves by discussing these issues, we need to go into, we are going into the archival documents. We are going to, we are going into the documents uh, such as the reports of of fisheries in Tamil Nadu, report of fisheries, annual reports on fisheries in West Bengal, and so on and so forth, to find that if there is some history behind it. But dams have been found to be uh, indispensable. But if dams have been found to be indispensable, then there is the other side of the story. How do you create a level playing field for the fishes? How can you think about fish passes? How can you think, think about fish ways? Can you think about fish ladders? Can you think about redesigning of lifts and locks? And can you think about passing uh, uh, all sorts of prohibitory control on uh, the sort of techniques and methods that were uh, in vogue so far as fishing is concerned? Now, these were also a matter of paramount concern for the British in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, and we find that these had been discussed to a great extent even uh, in England in the 19th century and more also in the 20th century because there was this great deal of debate when it came to water bodies and fisheries about what is customary law and what is common law. So. Uh, does fishing, will, will, it, will it be coming under the common law experiment? And if it comes under the common law, then what sort of rights, what sort of entitlements do the village communities have on the water bodies? Now, these are, these are questions which have sometimes been discussed by historians. And uh, uh, the historians here have actually sometimes made very, very important contributions. Uh, uh, Siva Ramakrishnan, for that matter, uh, and uh, Arun Agarwal, for that matter, have really uh, talked about a lot because they were not really not all not all of them were from history discipline. Many of them came in from anthropology. Many of, many of them came in from biology, but they really did a lot of very good work on South Asian history uh, in these particular areas, which now are clubbed under environmental history. So. So while in India in the 1860s we were studying uh, about the prospects of um, fisheries, particularly when dams were, uh, this entire designing of dams, setting up of dams was gaining in, important, uh, in importance, the, the, the main debate that, uh, that is there, not only in India, but it's also there as I've been talking about in England and in, and in America. We, we need to have a transnational approach. We just don't need to see the sort of ideas that have percolated in India simply as very localist concerns on the part of the colonial bureaucracy. Rather, I would say that there is a transnational perspective. And when we see the old archival records, there is this transnational perspective there because there are reference to what is happening in England and what is happening in America. And we, we find that uh, fish passes, right in the 1860s and 1870s, fish passes become a point of concern in both the US and in England. And we, we find that fish passes are invented. 
There are big names of Smith, Kale, Malloc in Great Britain. There are names of Brackett, Foster, Brewer, McDonald in America. All of them were very famous fish pass designers. And there are also quite a number of legislations. For example, the Salmon Fisheries Acts of 1868, of 1862, and the, 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 Fishing, the Fisheries Act of 1868 in Scotland, and then the 1871 fisheries uh, laws in England. And we find that there are a lot of people. For example, there is a character by the name of Frank Buckland, who is uh, the inspector of salmon fisheries in England. And he says that fishes would just die a natural death. The species, the species would die a natural death if you don't have fish passes. So even if people were dependent on fish as uh, as 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 a as a very important source of food or nutrients or or uh, as a very important source of food and sustenance. At the same time, people were also very very conscious that you needed to conserve, and that is what I think people like Buckland tried to argue. Now, the time around eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies, when all these ideas were there. In 1860s, there is a British official, there is a colonial official about whom very little has been discussed in independent India. We have tended to actually uh, always uh, think of the British Raj as oppressive, as exploitative, as uh, and everything in terms of drain of wealth, everything in terms of drain of wealth. We have not really visualized that there were thousands and hundreds of colonial officials who were more concerned about India than what present day Indians are concerned about India. And one of the persons in the service of the in the service of the uh, of, of the British government here in India was Sir Arthur Cotton. Cotton was born in India. He went back to England for his studies, then returned back to India. And he was knighted because he was one person who could understand the language of all the Indian rivers. Name one river where Cotton didn't visit. Cotton went to almost all these rivers, tried to study the river systems, tried to study the villages or the river, the river, the riverine areas, the sort of the, the, the riparian communities uh, around the big river systems their demands, their needs, their problems, and their hopes and aspirations, which were linked with bigger rivers like the Kaveri, the Ganga, the Mahanadi, and so on and so forth. So, and whatever we know, we as Bengalis, we, we always tend to uh, find uh, a solace in, um, you, you know, in some Bengali writer writing something about fishes and fisheries. We, we have not cared to read cotton. And Cotton in 1860s makes a very interesting, uh, uh, he has a very interesting proposition that why do, don't we uh, invest more about the, uh, the, this, uh, the, about the processes leading to desiltation of the rivers? Why don't we actually think of integrating the rivers, something which was done uh, during the regime of Jawaharlal Nehru in the 1950s that you integrate the, uh, the Ganga with the, with the Godavari and so on and so forth various sort of projects. Now, Cotton went beyond his official duties. Of course, he knew the, of course, he was drawn to the art of revenue maximization. He was very shrewd. He knew that he, he, he understood the logic of capitalism of water. Perhaps he's father of the logic of capitalism of water in India. But Cotton was also one who pointed out that you can have a very, very debilitating effect if you continue to build dams in this fashion on the rivers or on the water bodies, and these dams will have a very debilitating effect on the movement of fishes. So much so that in 1860s he comes up, and in 1869, Lord Mayo uh, commissions a doctor. He's a he's a full-fledged doctor, Samuel Francis Day. He has every high qualifications as a physician. But Samuel Francis Day is also brought into Indian service from London. And uh, Day uh, is certainly, he has, uh, he is a, a person who could be, whom I think biologists uh, should uh, 
write more about day rather than historians uh, writing more about day. As a doctor, he was more drawn to biological sciences. He wanted to understand. He wanted to know the different species, the thousands of species of of birds, animals, uh, fishes. He was particularly interested in fishes. And it reached uh, Lord Mayo's ears that, you know, this doctor can be the real biologist that you are looking out for. And he is one, you, you give him a tenure of two, three years, his only job is to take a boat, ride the boat on the Indian rivers and find out uh, uh, the list of fishes from the fishermen, from the local fishermen, tabulate them, write big narratives on the Mahasev, which he wrote on the Himalayan Mahasev, and so on and so forth. And it was Day who was commissioned to investigate all this, these big, big questions of whether we should actually, whether we should put obstacles on the water bodies and so on and so forth. And subsequently, he became the Inspector General of Fisheries in India. And they, once again, was very, very energetic. And he said that dams should not be uh, put across rivers in a very indiscriminate manner. Because dams uh, act as barriers to the passage of fishes. And therefore, it is very detrimental to, 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 to fisheries. And also, he says that fish passes have not been correctly designed. They have not been placed in the right places. As a result, in, to, be, to be very simple, what they says is, you see, the, there, are, there are certain fishes, as you know better than me, biologists know better than me, who have this propensity of moving up from the lower reaches to the higher reaches. Whether they do it for, for spawning purposes simply or whether there are certain other instincts which are, uh, which are actually peculiar to, those, uh, uh, to, to the animal world is something which is not always known to a historian. Perhaps the biologists know much better than what historians uh, know in this regard. But certainly when the dams are erected, at one point of time when they try to really move up the river, there are, there are these obstacles and they tend to be thrown off because there is this cascade of water which is coming over them. So they tend to be thrown off down to the lower reaches. So they, they might be climbing from the upper reach, from the lower reaches to the upper reaches. But after reaching a certain point of vantage where they could have easily crossed over and been to the other side of the dam, they tend to be thrown off and placed at far lower levels from where they might have started their journey. And there the fishermen are there and they are indiscriminately slaughtered. As a result of which, many of the fishes which are, which are laid with roe or eggs are slaughtered indiscriminately. So there is this annual depreciation in terms of the figures of fishes that abound, the, uh, that abound a particular river. So Day says that if you are to take the Kaveri, you have to take the lower Anikat, the, the dams on the, on the, the, which are the lower Anikat, the smaller dams, and place those fish passes there. And uh, he drew in a lot of ideas from, from Buckland's model. Now, when I looked into Samuel Francis Day's, um, this great book, Fishes and, uh, of, uh, Fishes and Fisheries of India, there's a copy of the, this particular book. It's very torn in the National Archives of India in Delhi. I, I have to search the Asiatic Society of Library before making any pronouncement that we don't have a copy of it here in Calcutta. Possibly we, we, we can have a copy here in the Asiatic Society. It has to be searched. Now, Hilsa was the fish which was hmm, his point of interest. And we Bengalis, we generally tend to uh, take up this Podda, Begda, the Ganga Bhagirathi networks as the habitats or the habitat of the Hilsa. But the Hilsa is also available in very large numbers in, uh, in Kaveri, in the Kaveri uh, area. And we find that Samuel Francis Day was very much concerned about this passage of the Hilsa uh, because, the Kaveri, because the Kaveri Hilsa was finding it very difficult to climb all the way from the sea down to the other side of the dam. And they were being indiscriminately dis, uh, slaughtered. As a result, the price of fishes in the Madras market or in the Madurai market, these two important terms, was increasing rapidly. So he was having the, the sort of the chart uh, so far as the price, the price chart of fishes were concerned in both Madras and, 
and Madurai, and he comes to this conclusion that see the prices from the prices what they were in the 1850s is no more uh, close to that range. Rather, they are exorbitantly high in the 1860s and 1870s, and it is all because the Hilsa and the other fishes which have had this propensity to move up the dam have not been able to do so, and they have been killed. Now, this entire uh, you know Samuel Francis Day's observ observations on the rivers because he's just not tied to South India. He also goes into the United Provinces, present day UP. He is one who goes to Orissa. He is one who goes to Punjab because every one of them have this great, have this grand vision about the Mahasair, the Himalayan Mahasair, and so on and so forth. So, and they also many of their experiments are actually tried out in Haridwar and Dehradun. So as to say, so fish pass, whether you can have a fish pass in Katak, whether you can have a fish ladder at Haridwar, or whether you can have, uh, whether you can have some ideas from the secretary of the Dehradun Fisheries Association, whether th these fish ladders uh, will be operative in places in up, in up, uh, in upland areas like Bhim Goda or Majapur, where the Northern Ganges canals take off. These are matters which have continue to excite Samuel Francis Day and many of the military engineers of the Royal Battalions. And uh, certainly, and certainly in the 19th, in the in the in the 1940s, uh, we have people like Hamid Khan of Undivided India, who studied this entire debate on fish ladders in the Punjab. Now, as a result, we find that uh, not only the fish pass, not only there are disagreements over uh, the construction of fish pass, the location of the fish pass, and so on and so forth, and the entire logic of having a fish pass. And how is it possible to actually correlate this very concept of fish passes with the concerns of hydraulic engineering, which are there in the late 19th and early 20th century? Apart from, the, uh, from that, we have uh, this, we have a lot of debate that is coming on, so uh, coming in so far as methods of strategies that are that are being that are that are quite common within the fishing communities of India. So Samuel Francis Day, uh, he reports his big report is uh, in his big report that fishes are also um, indiscriminately uh, slaughtered through very devious methods. Uh, you have a large number of nets. There are different types of nets which are used. And uh, there are also chemicals or poisons which are used. And this is very peculiar to the Indian scene. Apart from the entire debate on whether the colonial state can actually intervene so far as fisheries are concerned or a river is concerned by imposing their will because it goes against the principle of common law as it operates in some parts of India. But right till the, till the early part of the 20th century, there have been series of papers written in America and Canada, I mean, I mean North America, which is the main area where primarily biologists have written about dams and the problems of migratory fishes. And we need to really seriously look into these, these sort of uh, research projects that were carried, carried out uh, in the night, right from the 1920s down to the 1940s. And the, the American Society of Ichthyologists uh, uh, which had its uh, base in Stanford University, uh, was one of those particular organizations which actually went into this entire business of preservation of fish. Now, so far as Kaveri and Bitur is concerned, so Kaveri uh, was the large storage reservoir was decided uh, to be built at Metur in 1910. And this was also the time when the Madras uh, Fisheries Department was in its infancy. It was sanctioned by the Secretary of State in 1924. And the Fisheries Department was not really consulted. It did not have that much of teeth. And as a result, it was all the engineers. Now, even people like Vishweshwaraya, for that matter, were involved with this mature experiment so much as also the, the, uh, the, the British engineers who were uh, affiliated to the irrigation department. I don't think a biologist was concerned. 
well, well, the, 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 the Abalaj's opinion was, was taken into consideration at that length of time. And we find that the we that that Kaveri is undoubtedly uh, one of those large rivers uh, which could vie with the Krishna uh, in South India, and uh, and the and the Kaveri flows past many of these ancient towns like uh, like Tajor or Tajabur, and uh, we also find that uh, there are also uh, you know waterfalls on the Kaveri uh, for that matter from the upland areas. For example, uh, people know about the Shiva Samudra, Shiva Samudra waterfalls. And the, actually, the river actually takes a, um, takes a, it takes, a, it, it goes through a gradient, actually. It comes down a descent of 320 feet. So that makes the, the river look like a waterfall in the Madras presidency. And the Shiva Samudra falls are a barrier, are a complete barrier to the ascent of fish. So there is this dam. And we find that once the Mitu dam is constructed, there is this huge hundreds of miles on the river, which is, uh, which is affected. Because you might have water for irrigation, but you have, but now you are also in the risk of getting less and lesser number of water species. So as a result, we find that there is a lot of talk about the improvement that Mittur can bring. Not first is irrigation, second is power. But nobody in the Mittur, uh, so far as the reports on the Mittur project are, uh, is concerned, nobody has written about what happens to these animals, what happens to these species. And we find that a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people who were in the fisheries department, they were, of course, biologists. But uh, they were Sarkari, uh, they were uh, Sarkari officials. They were very much uh, officials of the government, like the Zoological Survey of India and so on and so forth. But these people were, used to work with the fisheries department, these biologists. And these biologists say that it is just not Hilsa that we are going to study. We also have to study the Katla, which was, which has, which was some of the uh, other introduced into the reservoir system here in South India. And uh, and we have to uh, see how these particular fishes are affected. Now, the fishes are affected because the biologists feel that even if you had a smaller dam, perhaps they could have still survived. But if you have very large masonry constructions like the Mitro Dam, it is impossible for them to climb up. It is impossible for them to survive. So as a result, all of them tend to get, uh, they tend to accumulate down in the lower slopes. They rarely have no opportunity so far as their reproductive behavior is concerned or for their other instincts to go up the river. Now, this is going against nature. Now, now why is it important for a historian and a biologist uh, to talk about these? It is necessary because we need to have a survey of the fishery resources of the various river systems, which we don't have in India. We need to have a picture of what, a picture of, of the developments before the dams were built and the picture after the dams were built. We, we need to study these old records to know the, to, 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 to have exact information about the seasons and occasions when mass migration of fishes have, have occurred in various rivers. They, they are different from one another. The, the mass migration is different from one another so far as rivers are concerned. Then we need to, then this could aid us, help us in the analysis of random samples to determine the kinds, the sizes and conditions of fishes which congregate at the dam. Why do they congregate? Why do they congregate at the opening of the sluices? And why do they migrate at all? These are issues, I think, which are which people which make which should make biologists and historians very emotional that we have not been doing all these things for years. And even if we have been doing it, we have been doing it from our very, very narrow disciplinary and backgrounds. And this is what 
Professor Dr. Uh, Ray Banerjee was referring to. Now, we find that it is that when we study the uh, the 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 Kolerun, uh, which is a tributary of the uh, Kaveri on which the Betul uh, project has been built, uh, uh, we find that there is a great great reference to the Katla, which is talked annually in the Betul, in the Betul reservoir. Since the formation of the reservoir and the and the reduction in the height has been able to allow these fishes to ascend the falls. So in some cases, they have been able to uh, go beyond the falls. And there are there are uh, species of um, of fishes which are referred. For for example, the Sirhina serosa, the Mystius aor, the Mystia singhala, the Labio fimbriatus. Now. They say that these fishes continuously face are facing problems so far as ascending the the river is concerned or ascending the dams are concerned and every year at the same time fishermen complain before these biologists who are attached to the fisheries department that it, that the fishes are rather inadequate the catch is small compared to the previous years and it's a, uh, they say that they really cannot define the exact season when these fishes will appear in the river systems. I think we are facing the same sort of situation even even till today, when certain fishes are certainly going out of our palate because we don't find those fishes anymore. Rather, it is the off-season variety that comes in, and whether we don't know whether they are caught right now or whether they have been preserved in the cold storages. Uh, uh, and they've been lying there for two years or so. Now, fishes generally are uh, tended to, but the debates generally bring out these sides of the story. Fishes generally congregate at the dam whenever water is let down, and there seems to be no particular reason for their migration. A repeated analysis of the samples uh, showed that all the 14 species except the burial, the spiny eel and the true eel are attracted in large numbers by the flowing water in the in the part of the Ellis canal system, which is part where, it, where there are both high and low level sluice channels. These fishes assemble and, they, and they, they are in relative abundance throughout the year. Also fish of all sizes are found, adult fish however being very few. At times, some have ripe eggs and flowing milk. It is therefore clear that these migrations are not really for uh, that much for breeding so much as for as for the dispersal of the species. So the debates bring out these sides of the story. Perhaps the biologists would be able to answer more clearly than a historian. Now we find that 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 Metur actually has also led to absolute absence of certain species. There is a permanent rise in the level of water. There is submergence of rocks and banks, and there is accumulation of silt in the bed of the river reservoir. These have their resultant changes. Prawns are directly affected. Prawns like to live on the sandy beds and weedy banks, and they have totally disappeared. A gradual extinction of species which do not survive in stagnant waters and their replacement by fish adopted to such conditions of life is an inevitable part of this process. And we find that whatever they were writing in the late 19th century, early part of the 20th century, they would say that a lot of things, a lot of developments would take place in the future. So these were these the future holds good for the people in the knowledge industry because so many new varieties of fishes could, could come in. But at the same time, heavy floods, rapid currents do also have an impact on the lives of the fishes. Fishes of all kinds are not really geared. They are not in a position to survive in these sort of situations. And some of them are no longer able to dig deep or take shelter in the deep pools. Some of them might be blown away by the by the by the gush of water. 
And we find that these large, these deep pools are no more deep pools. They are also being covered with sand and silt. As a result, the entire breeding process of the fishes is affected. Now, this is a loss. This is a loss to mankind and it is a loss, loss to the natural world. The, the colonial officials would make, make us believe that these are losses so far as fisheries are concerned. But these are grave, grave losses or, or these are dispel a disaster to our ecosystem. We, and just because we didn't have people to work on the um, biologists, historians and anthropologists like in the US, to work on the Columbia River, we, we are not able to assess the damage that has been caused because of the Kaveri Metro project. Had we had a project like the Columbia River in the US or the Grand Coulee Dam, we could have assessed it further. We could have done a very, very good comparative story, but that is not there. And we now, what we are now, we, we, are, we, are, we would like to end this entire a uh, debate or discussion by saying that, yes, water is getting scarce. The logic with which the dams were built, the sort of the sort of great advantage of the big dam system has been lost in the 1960s and 1970s. Environmentalists, biologists, social activists, development specialists have all argued that rather than giving water to him, to mankind, dams have robbed mankind of the supply of water. It has made water more scarce in the rivers. And as a result, the species, the fishes have declined. The number of species have declined. Many have gone into extinction. No more you have, the communities are able to sustain themselves. Those particular human communities who live by the side of the riparian uh, systems are able to sustain their lives. So there are long charts, there are long reports, there are equally very copious volumes of statistics on the river systems. And they all give details about the administrative part of the story. There are sometimes the social aspect of the side of the story resulting from this curious relationship between dam building and, and its impact on fisheries. And I think we, we are now in a situation where we need to take up these studies in a far more serious earnest than ever before, because as we as we are now going down into this entire philosophy of the end of the end of the world, perhaps there is more. There should be more discussion not only on human beings, but our friends, the carp, the catfish, the Himalayan mahaser, and so on and so forth, the, uh, to understand what they also feel in a sort of a globalized world. And the globalized world is just not the 1991 globalized world, uh, the, the process of globalization that had started in South Asia. Even British rule is a part of the globalizing world. And this sort of globalizing instinct and the sort of relations that the natural world has with the human world is a matter which should bring the biologists and the historians in, on a common platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, Hello. interest, such an interest. Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting lecture and so interesting to know how the aquatic wildlife is so threatened by the dams. Uh, so, sir, there is uh, one question till now. So, if you allow, I can just ask it. Hmm. So, other than dams, poor water quality also acts as a barrier, especially in case of Indian rivers like the Ganges. So, from a historian's perspective, how water pollution has shaped the aquatic ecosystem? Um. Well, of course, yes, uh, because uh, it's just not siltation. It's also uh, we had this, we never had this uh, problem before, at least 120 years back or 125 years back uh, so far as the 
the the Ganges was concerned, we didn't have this problem. But now, in a hundred years time, we we have so many of chemical industries lined up uh, uh, in the towns which are very, uh, which are adjacent to the to the Ganges, and uh, and also a large number of towns which don't have a proper uh, sanitation facilities, and which would rather um, the excreta would rather end up in the river, leading to the pollution of the river from the human excreta. So uh, these are problems of uh, very uh, uh, rapid um, and uh, desperate um, urbanization, uh, sort of a jungle ur urbanization. So this sort of um, this is also a problem which has affected um, the, uh, the, the 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 water the the water animals, uh, the aquatic uh, species. So as to say, and for example, Varanasi. If one takes a very, if one takes a day, day Samuel day, Samuel Francis Day's concerns of 1860s and early 1870s when he was doing this sort of investigative work, um, he would uh, mention the river otter, which was there. But now, if you go down to Varanasi in, and if you speak to the boatmen in the last 50, 60 years, how many times have people cited the river otter? It's, very, it's a rare sight if you just happen to see it. So, and you also, do, and you also have the dwindling uh, numbers of uh, river dolphins, so as to say. So, definitely, uh, this sort of water pollution is giving rise to a new system altogether where the putrid atmosphere is, is definitely driving away the animals or killing them. We don't really know. As a result of which, uh, this could also be taken as a very, very important uh, source of uh, debilitation when it comes to uh, our discussion today, because this is a later day. I think as a historian, I would say that it is a, it's a later day problem. It's a problem which did not exist when Samuel Francis Day or the other colonial bureaucrats were looking into these particular issues. Uh, but it is only now that for the last 50, 60 years, we have also the Ganga pollution board, the Ganga um, cleaning up projects and so on and so forth in Varanasi, burning of courses on the riverbanks, throwing away parts of the courses into the rivers. These are all matters which have which have come in, in the 1980s. Perhaps they should have they should have been here before. Before towns like Kranauj, before towns like uh, Varanasi became much more disparate in terms of urban dwelling. But that's another issue altogether. Okay, so another question is like we heard that dams can be detrimental to the uh, species uh, fish. Can it also be effective in the, uh, the generation of new fish species? Well, that is that is a that's a that's a real tricky side. Uh, uh, the conventional fishes which used to go up, which used to have a free movement uh, across the river. Uh, from the from the southern reaches to the northern reaches, well, of course, uh, they have fish problems. But there are also equal references that new varieties of fishes have appeared. And uh, by new varieties of fishes, we really don't know whether they were denizens of the past, whether they were not really counted that much or under the new sort of geological or uh, engineering um, technicalities they have emerged we don't really don't don't really know about it but certainly there is every possibility that new generation of species with with greater instincts of survival or with the, uh, with 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 a greater agenda of survival they might have come and they might have settled in the rivers but that might not but that doesn't really rule out the loss of the extinction that the loss that is coming from extinction and another question is that uh, colonization has introduced a lot of new species, some of which are invasive. Is there any data about effect of uh, the dams on these non-invasive, uh, sorry, non-native or invasive fishes over the period of time? Uh, well, there is a uh, well for the Madras Presidency. We have uh, Nicholson's report. Who was the the director of the fisheries, very famous Nicholson. Uh, you know, some of these fishes. Uh, which were introduced into India, possibly from Africa. There are some references. 
that uh, they were um, used, they were, they were just thrown into the drains or into the soak pits to eat up the larva. And these were some of those new uh, fishes which were being introduced. There is some bit of data on this, but so far as the rivers were concerned, we really don't have much data on the introduction. The British didn't really much write on the introduction of new fishes. So there we don't have, but so far as the uh, so far as the uh, the uh, the urban uh, the the uh, the the local municipal uh, or the local municipal department was concerned, we have certain we have certain data that some of these new varieties of fishes were being used to eat up the larva of the mosquitoes, and this was one of those particular experiments which was favored by even people like uh, Nicholson to. Uh, keep away the incidence of malaria, which was really, which was, which really raised high so far as colonial South India was concerned. Okay, so another question from Bijay is what would be the best uh, strategy that we can adopt to mitigate these problems so that we can maintain a sustainable aquatic ecosystem along with sustainable development? Now, this is a very, uh, very complicated question to answer. One of the ways I think uh, which has been suggested in, in, in America and Europe is to break down the, the dams. Um, and uh, there have been some very good dividends so far as uh, this entire policy of breaking down dams and weirs are concerned in both Europe and in North America and trying to make the rivers free, uh, uh, free so far as their, uh, as their flow is concerned. Now, this is one of the ways I think uh, you can bring back to some extent the lost ecosystem. Because by this time, the ecosystem that, that is there is something, it's, it's a matter of adaptability. It might have come because of the new set of circumstances. Uh, you cannot really go back to the old and you cannot say that everything is old. There is nothing called old. So there must, must have been a past before the old as well. So, but... To have a certain a modicum of sustainable aquatic ecosystem, we need to have first of all a thorough uh, audit of the of the irrigation works that have been there since the British times down to present times, and to see how much of human interests are served through dams and weirs rather than misery, the degree of misery. And it's only then that when we take the human misery into consideration, we also take the income level or the the, the penury and the poverty levels of the of the communities which are dependent on fishes are on fishes so once we see their dwindling in incomes that is also a part which is linked to the ecosystem to the to the ecosystem that has been generated because of the dams and weirs so if we we if we have a proper audit then and then only we can really say that whether we really have any purpose to do we would have any purpose to do by breaking open the dams, but uh, but I believe that 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 should have been the uh, case, but rather yeah, contrary prevails. So uh, that is all the question that we have. Uh, so I would now request uh, Professor Renare Banerjee to uh, come in and address. Thank you, Shinjiri. I was sitting glued to the uh, laptop, such an interesting uh, discussion, Professor Basu. It was so enjoyable. And uh, so the, the one thing that I find very intriguing through all that riveting discussion is that how much of different disciplines seem to be tied in together. So there is the, you know, the hydrological forces in play. So people with completely different kinds of trainings would like to assess that because the water bodies would be very, very different as far as the component of the water is concerned, the flow is concerned, all the climatic forces. Then the engineers who um, construct bridges or dams or fish passes. Then the ecologists who actually study people like us, zoologists and botanists and microbiologists who study the planktons and the bacteria and the, the macrofauna and the flora. Then the uh, policy uh, that governs. So the, the most recent disaster in Uttarakhand with the explosion of the glacier, lots of narratives are being spun that this went wrong and that went wrong. I think to preempt such disasters, 
the, a systems study is necessary. And I think your last uh, comment very nicely sort of sums it up is that the audit has to be done by people who are experts in different disciplines. And then it has to be tied together into the policies for development, economy, uh, you know, mm -hmm. laws, the, the codes of conduct that govern mm -hmm. us, uh, you know, our responsibilities and our rights. So we come back to the Constitution. We have mm -hmm. just uh, celebrated our Republic Day mm -hmm. and we come back to that. So it is uh, so interdisciplinary and so many things are tied up. And while I was listening to your very interesting and detailed talk, I, I couldn't help uh, thinking that when one writes a scientific paper one is limited to certain areas because a certain kind of journal would uh, like to publish that mm -hmm. and so the data and uh, you know the inferences from the data are done in a very specific way because that discipline mm -hmm. that journal uh, demands that of you exactly. however exactly. a historical journal or a social sciences journal would be more verbose and the narratives would be more qualitative and that is so important. I think when we look at science only from a very narrow scientific perspective, and like you said, science should be, you know, more, uh, the word should be used in more of a, you know, philosophical connotation of the thing rather than just the disciplines and what it uh, demands. So I think that audit, what you just said, also takes, um, uh, it, it ought to take in expertise of, say, climatologists and then social scientists the culture, the practices of the people that directly uh, contributes to public health issues. And I think uh, the whole thing ties up to probably the greatest challenge that is facing us today, which is water security and food security as a you know, sustainable and renewable um, you know, adhar, like we say, of the um, uh, life that sustains it and that we use as food. So uh, I think uh, uh, we might also talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the funding and the kind of uh, grants that could be written over it in a completely interdisciplinary format. Exactly. And I think uh, the government, international and national funding agencies is also encouraging, for example, in skill development projects or in, uh, you know, problem solving projects. Uh, it mm -hmm. is being encouraged increasingly that a consortium style, uh, you know, collaboration between different mm -hmm. institutes and with uh, people with different disciplines and different skills come mm -hmm. together to solve a problem. So would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, both in principle or in times or in terms of academic engagement, I think uh, Professor Ray Bamji's um, venture, uh, I think, um, should be taken um, with a great deal of seriousness. Uh, and I believe that uh, as I began my discussion today, uh, alluding to the same um, point on the same platform that we should be in, uh, I think we should now uh, think of our projects, despite our disciplinary and constraints, our boundaries. We need to talk more across disciplines and in future we design some research projects because as we know uh, as professors in the university, sometimes we apply, we don't get funds. Uh, the, the project is rejected. You know, some funding agency doesn't find it that interesting or it is beyond the purview, their purview. But at times we also, there are also international agencies which are able to, you know, accommodate this very logic that up uh, there that there would be biologists, there would be historians, there would be anthropologists and sociologists and uh, development specialists together. So, and I think these sort of projects uh, are very essential because it also helps to train our students who are very cocoonized. Either they are cocoonized within the labs or in their classrooms in the science faculty or in the humanities faculty. They don't seem to know each other in terms of social communication as well. And of course, when these projects come, I think we also are able to be, uh, we are also able to experiment more because uh, we are able to talk to one another much more closely, much more intensely than what we had in the past. And also try to evolve some new methodological strategies, strategies which we have never utilized before. 
and also some new ways of doing things uh, uh, at the uh, at the field level. So I think uh, a historian could also be energized to come out of the armchair existence and you know, made to work in the field by a biologist or an anthropologist in their own way. So I think this is very, very essential. And I think Professor Ray Banerjee, if she takes a bit of leap forward, we are there to, to jump the extra mile for her. We will definitely be there. Absolutely. I think the choice based credit system that we have already introduced in our undergraduate and postgraduate studies aims to do exactly that. And I think we can take the baby steps by a little internships across um, different disciplines so that, um, you know, one can get out of that comfort zone and, you know, that extra push that they are anyway doing uh, for, you know, scoring the required marks for the CBCS. And they can actually get some more training on it, understand the subject a little better than the core subject in which they are training. So exactly. on that note, uh, I think um, we have had an, a very interesting Saturday evening. Thank you so much, Professor Boshu, for giving us thank the time and for answering the thank questions you. so nicely. And thanks to the audience who has stayed with us. Um, I think uh, during the new normal, we were all uh, forced to stay indoors and we had a better live uh, viewership. But in this format, more questions come in later as people um, revisit the archive talks and uh, so we might uh, share some of the questions that come in later i of hope uh, we can take this beyond this uh, you know webinar and uh, take it to uh, actual fruition uh, of a project uh, of uh, you know uh, policy long term policy that mm -hmm. actually affects us so it is important to look back into the past and who better than a historian to uh, you know give this little snippets <coughs> to to tie together into a uh, you know comprehensive uh, narrative so thank, thank you, you so much and thanks to our moderator shinjini and our yeah, host nondita and uh, yes and akashlina and uh, Bijoy and Shoheli and everybody else who has asked such interesting questions and made our uh, lecture so very interactive. <coughs> so with that, we end tonight's talk. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Shinjini, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. So you joining. have to repeat that. Yes. Sir. You have to repeat the entire yes. last bit. So thank you, ma'am. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Join us tomorrow for a lecture by Dr. Srinivas V. Kaveri of Inserm Paris. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, www.zoologyhub.org. Our talks will be archived in our YouTube channel, so you can che check them out later. And thank you again for joining us. Take care and see you again tomorrow.